Atoms got to win. Greetings and welcome to this year's Dr. Peggy Hill Memorial Lecture in Indigenous Health. Delighted that you're here. My name is Dr. Chase Everett McMurrin. I'm also called Water Song Medicine Keeper, and I'm the theme lead for Indigenous Health within the MD program in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'd love to introduce you to Goen Anolo, who will offer an invocation as we begin our time together. Goen Anolo, Cynthia White, is from the Mohawk community of Akwesasne. Her lineage is Onondaga, Snipe Clan. She currently lives at the Six Nations Grand River Territory in Southern Ontario. Cynthia sits on the Council of Soul of the Mother, a creator-centered team who have been spiritually trained. The council has traveled among First Nations and across the globe to bring the sacred fire for strengthening the relationship of individuals and community to Creator and Mother Earth. Currently, Cynthia is a traditional healer in Aboriginal services at the Center for Addictions and Mental Health, using Indigenous knowledge to impact mental health services in Ontario for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Go Nanolo, welcome. Nyawa Chase, thank you so much for that introduction. Sego, so guego. Governor Nolu Yungets. Anadaga Kwisaslona, the Wistu Isni. My Mohawk name is Precious Words, and I come from the Mohawk territory of Akwisasni, the land where the partridge drums. I, uh, my, my lineage is Anadaga, and my clan is the Snipe clan. And so uh, I have this uh, beautiful braid of sweetgrass, the medicine of the eagle and this beautiful white eagle feather. And as I burn this medicine and offer it out to everyone participating, and of course the universe, spirit knows no boundary of space and time. And the medicine of the sweet grass removes loneliness and replaces it with love. And we could all use more love. And we're being judged as to how we share that love. And before I go any further, I'm going to offer some words of greetings and thanksgiving. Sego, skena go some great diso, governor no lo yungets. Nyawa some great diso ne one is leo. Nyawa yet any stone a hundred than as a guago gonna lunqua. There's a dawia yaki sutta than a gonna la guago, the ganos. I give you greetings, creator, in the great peace. My name is Precious Words, and we thank you for this beautiful day that you've put in front of us. We send our love and our gratitude to our mother, the earth, and to all of creation for providing all the things that we need for a good life. And we call upon the, the spirit helpers of the creator, the grandmothers and the grandfathers and our ancestors to come and to gather around us, to lift us up, to open our minds and our hearts so that we can come together in that one mind of, and heart. <clears throat> and I'd like to acknowledge all those elements of creation because when we do so, when we give our thanks, as is our duty as human beings, we further and perpetuate the life force that moves through all those elements of creation. So we give our gratitude to the mineral life, the oldest form of life that was gathered from all the beautiful dusts of the, and the corners of the universe and brought to form our mother, the earth. We give thanks to all the waters, the salt waters, the fresh waters, the rain waters, and those waters that bring forward that new life, the birth waters. We give our love and our gratitude to all the plant life, the flowers, the grasses, the trees, who are all making ready for that sleep time of the winter. And the lead of the medicines is the tobacco. The tobacco is our connection to the spirit, our connection to the creator. <clears throat> when you hold that sacred tobacco, it's like holding the creator's hand. We give thanks to the, all the animal life, the crawling life, the swimming life, the four leggeds and the winged ones. And of course, our brothers and sisters, the two leggeds. We give thanks to those four winds who refresh and renew 
all of creation. And as we look up to the heavens, we see that great warrior, the sun, rising each day to give us a clean start. As that medicine washes over the earth and creation, it burns away all of those negative things that do not serve us so we can begin anew. We look to the grandmother moon and we give thanks that during the nighttime, she shines and she warms us during the nighttime, praying for us, watching over us, protecting us, and tending to the life force that moves through all female life and creation. Nyawa, miigwech grandmother. And then we look to that star formation, the Milky Way that bridges this world to that next world, the sky world. And at the end of our days walking the earth, hopefully we'll make one final crossing and return to that place of peace. We look to the stars that represent our ancestors and it's our ancestors that, that constantly watch over us and pray for us and visit us many times during our waking hours and during our dream time to bring us sacred messages and, and divine guidance. Thank you ancestors, because you know what it is to have a wounded heart and a troubled mind. And now that you sit in that place of all knowing, you can truly guide us and help us to navigate the challenges that lie in front of us on our life's journey. We look to that great council fire of the creator where many spirit helpers sit, the great healers and teachers and messengers and every time we call on them, they come to us and they help us to bring us those things that we need, that those elements that need change in our life and correction. And make no mistake, in this time, we need much correction because we're being called to task by the Creator and all of creation as to how we're going to be in relationship with one another and those elements of creation. How are we going to treat those things that sustain us and give us life? And so we call upon those grandmothers and grandfathers, those great spirit helpers to visit us and to hold us and to shape our minds and, and build up the fire of our spirit and to smooth out the rough edges that surround our heart so that our minds can come together and our hearts can come together as one. And on this day, Zungwai Diesel, the creator, the one who made us, the great mystery. We ask you to hold us and to clean our minds so that when we listen to the words and hear that powerful medicine that will come, may it live inside us. Yawa, chimigwach. Miigwech, Gonanolo. Thank you very much. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. David McKnight to offer a land acknowledgement uh, to support and, and um, ready us further for our time together tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> we acknowledge that this land on which the University of Toronto operates, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I also recognize that we are gathered virtually in an institution and a country with a colonial, colonial history, and that we need to work to address ongoing colonial harms and continuing racism. Land acknowledgements are only a starting point for larger conversations and concrete acts of restitution and transformation. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. So I now have uh, the special honor of introducing this year's a guest lecturer for the, the annual Dr. Peggy Hill Memorial Lecture. A quick note about Dr. Peggy Hill, uh, that if you don't know much about her, please Google her. Um, please know uh, what a trailblazer she certainly was. Um, I, I found it quite remarkable that in order for her to do her training, 
uh, she she had to find different accommodations because there weren't room for women when she was in medical school or internship, specifically internship. Um, that, um, in her operating room experience, she had uh, a different experience than the nurses uh, who had to look away from patients in the operating room if the patient was a man uh, because it wasn't appropriate for them to look at the patient. So. Peggy Hill saw a lot in her years, um, and, and it's, it's remarkable to imagine um, the, the legacy that she's offered um, in, in finding different forms of equity within uh, medical practice and healthcare in general. So I'd like to introduce Suzanne Mathot to you. Uh, so I think get ready to hear what she has to say tonight. Suzanne Mathot is the author of the nonfiction book, Legacy, Trauma, Story, and Indigenous Healing. She's an educator and community worker who speaks on human rights, pedagogy, indigenous literatures, indigenous worldviews, indigenous approaches to health and wellness, trauma and healing informed practice, and decolonization. She also designs programs and facilitates change-making sessions for the education, healthcare, environmental, and museum sectors. Suzanne has worked in advocacy and direct service positions at indigenous organizations since 1992, serving community members who are marginalized by racism, poverty, homelessness, health status, addictions, mental health challenges, crime, and victimization. She was previously an executive member of the board of directors at the West Central Community Health Centers in Toronto. Suzanne is a Sinawachi Nahio, Rocky Mountain Cree, and currently lives near Nanaimo, BC. Um, after Suzanne shares, um, there will be some time for Q&A. So if you'd like to type in questions in the Q&A, feel free. We'll take a look at them after Suzanne speaks. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction and also the opening. Um, I feel very centered. <laughs> um, so I'm going to sort of reintroduce myself a little bit just to, you know, identify my lineage and, and where I am on, you know, the earth tonight. So I will say Danse, uh, Suzanne Nitsiyosun. Um, that means hello, my name is Suzanne in Cree. I am Sinuachi Nehio, as Chase has said, um, from Saigatawa. Uh, Saigatawa is also known as Peace River, Alberta. It's located in Treaty 8 territory. But I should note that the Sinuachi Nehioak are not signatories to Treaty 8 or Treaty 6 or Treaty 7 in Alberta. Our territory ranges from the area around Jasper, Alberta, north to Saigatawa. But when Jasper National Park was created in 1907, we were removed from the Jasper area by the government of Canada. So I join you today from Gabriola Island, which is the unceded territory of the Sunamuk Nation. I'm in between the mainland of British Columbia and the Big Island or Vancouver Island. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, it is really an honor to connect with you all. Uh, to begin, I would like to extend my thanks to the community, to the elders, the medicine people, colleagues, ancestors, descendants, and community members who have included me, who have shown me, taught me what I needed to know, keep teaching me. I am privileged to have been and be in dialogue with them to work alongside them and to share with them. And I sit here today with the honor of addressing you because they have schooled me in what it means to be human, what it means to be indigenous, I think I'm sort of getting that, and what it means to create relationships defined by respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. So hi, hi, that is thank you in Cree. During my lifetime, I have seen many, many positive changes in the relationship between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people in Canada. Media are talking to us instead of about us. 
Educators are teaching about residential schools and inviting Indigenous people to their classrooms. Still, the 2015 Wellesley Institute report, First Peoples, Second Class Treatment, which I know or hope you have all read, identified significant barriers to access for Indigenous peoples in the healthcare system, including pervasive racism and a lack of cultural safety and a lack of trauma-informed care. And more recently in 2019, the Viennes Commission in Quebec examined a range of public services and released a final report that identified areas of concern in healthcare delivery to Indigenous peoples in that province. Now, over the last 30 years in my work as a volunteer with Anishinaabe Health Toronto Street Patrol, um, as a board member at Parkdale Queen West Community Health Centre, and my work in social service organizations, I have had the pleasure of knowing many caring, dedicated clinical practitioners and healthcare professionals. They want to make a difference in their patients, their clients' lives. They want to make sure that the places they work are accessible to Indigenous peoples. However, I have found that this care is too often delivered in a way that foregrounds Western biomedical approaches, Time after time, I saw clients whose complaints of chronic pain were ignored. I know from my work with them that they were survivors of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. And I also know that they were never asked to tell the stories of their lives during their visits to hospitals and clinics. Time after time, I saw medical practitioners treat the symptoms of a person's physical imbalance instead of the source of that imbalance. And by that, I mean the unresolved emotions, such as terror, anger, fear, and grief that they carried. It became clear to me that even the most enlightened biomedical practitioners, those who understand the importance of looking at illness and disease through a biopsychosocial lens, were unaware of how the historic events of colonization and the continuing policies and practices of colonialism affect indigenous bodies, minds, and spirits. Time after time, I also saw that although the care was coming from the absolute best of intentions, it was not coming from a place that understood or in some cases respected indigenous concepts of health and wellness. So in that sense, the care ended up being yet another form of violence per perpetrated against Indigenous people by the colonial state. Now, the good news is Canada, I think, is beginning to understand the violence of colonization, how Indigenous leaders were wrongly convicted and murdered by the state in the hanging of Chilcotin Nation Chief Ahan in 1865, the 1885 public executions in Battleford, Saskatchewan, the hanging of Louis Riel, and so many other examples across this land. How Indigenous people were deliberately starved and pushed off unceded lands by the government of John A. Macdonald in order to put through the railway how the cross-generational transfer of knowledge was interrupted by the banning of Indigenous ceremonies and cultural practices and the apprehension of Indigenous children from their homes. Those are just three examples of the violence of colonization. There are many more. These events all happened in the past, at least for those of you who understand time as linear. Because these events happened in the past, I'm not sure that Canada really understands the violence of ongoing colonialism, the colonization that is going on today as we speak. Colonialism is about imperialism, capitalism, absolute relentless expansion, and resource extraction. It is, in all its forms, about exploitation, which closely dovetails with oppression. And it's only possible if a person sees the world through a lens of linear individualism and competition. 
I want to share with you a Cree word, though. Wakotun. That's the Nehiwak or Cree word for kinship. That's its literal meaning. And it refers to the interconnectedness of relationships, communities, and natural systems. It's also used to refer to Nehiwak law or conduct because, of course, we are responsible for respecting our relations. Now, I think this word tells us a lot about the Indigenous world. In the Indigenous world, power is not attained by having power over something or someone. It is attained by creating power with something or someone. Now, this power with is an interconnectedness. It focuses on healthy relationships with other people and with the natural world. And it is what, to a Cree person, creates balance. And balance is what creates good health. From an Indigenous perspective, good health is dependent on social relations, personal responsibility, a healthy spirit, and the health of the natural world of which we are a part. This is what creates a healthy body. Western biomedicine reduces physical health to the individual and to the micro world of cells and microscopes and those sorts of things. A, a rare world that is only accept, acceptable, perhaps accessible is what I meant to say, <laughs> to experts who act as gatekeepers to information, to diagnosis, and to healing. Indigenous science and medicine, though, it enlarges our ways of seeing so that health, wellness, and illness are situated within complex and interlocking webs that place the human body inside the natural world, as I've said. The everyday world of life here and our connection to the spirit world. And it makes this process, this knowledge acceptable to everyone when we are located within. And that means everyone can then take the information and the transformative changes attached to illness and healing as life-sustaining lessons in living well together. Indigenous medicine sees disease as dis-ease, where physiology becomes disrupted and turns against itself. So the Indigenous medicine person, as a result, will ask what is causing the disruption. They look to clues in the patient's story and in the natural world around the patient. Then they seek to address this disruption using treatments that return the individual's body, mind, and spirit to a state of balance. In Indigenous worldviews, there are no silos. Silent, science and medicine are philosophy and history and literature, and by literature I mean oral or written, and an individual's internal environment is more important in determining and recovering from dis-ease than the infecting agent or pathogen itself. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> You're thinking, but that's just not correct. Indigenous peoples don't have science. What you're talking about is just spirituality. It's myth. These are beliefs, and they are incompatible with the rational, the mathematical, and the scientific. Well, to that, I will reply that your beliefs because what you just thought is indeed a belief and not a fact, have a lot to do with linear European views of history, where the past is thought to be uncivilized and the contemporary time period is seen as enlightened and, you know, past all that silly superstitious stuff. It is this thinking, this mindset, that creates the foundation for continued violence against Indigenous patients seeking care. Lawyer Alyssa Lombard said recently that Joyce Echequan's death in a Quebec hospital 
after being subjected to racist comments is not a case of simply some bad apples in the system. She said that it reveals a, quote, putrid orchard. That orchard is not one person's racist or discriminatory action. It is the garden in which medical practitioners are grown and trained and the ecosystem that surrounds them in practice. Systems are created by people, to be sure, but they are also created from within the dominant society's mindset, the beliefs that characterize and define colonialism. A 2020 Canadian Medical Education Journal article details what happened when 514 members of the Canadian Rheumatology Association were sent surveys that asked about their awareness of Indigenous health practices and the attitudes they held around including Indigenous health practices in patient care plans. Respondents were provided with the World Health Organization's definition of traditional medicine, and they were asked about their perceptions on the inclusion of specific healing practices, such as the therapeutic use of plant materials, counseling and the use of relationships during healing, and spiritual and ceremonial practices. 73% of respondents rated themselves as unaware of what Indigenous healing practices were. 93% of respondents expressed interest in the concept of creating space for Indigenous healing practices in patient care plans, although those who graduated before 1976 were less open. Despite admitting that they were unaware of Indigenous healing practices, however, between half and two thirds of all respondents felt that there were health risks associated with including Indigenous healing practices. The most frequent perceived risks were inability to assess risk due to lack of knowledge. That was 77%. Potential of healing practices to interfere with prescription medications, also at 77%. And potential interference with biomedical treatment plans, including patient adherence to Western-based therapy. That was 68% of respondents. Respondents reported higher levels of agreement with the use of spiritual and ceremonial practices and wellness counseling than with the use of herbal medicines. Respondents between the ages of 40 to 60 indicated higher agreement with the use of herbal medicines in disease management, symptom management, and inpatient chronic illness than their older, over 60, and younger, under 40, counterparts. Now that doesn't actually surprise me, given the lack of inclusion of Indigenous histories, experiences and perspectives and the resulting lack of cross-cultural exchange in Canadian education and society 50 to 60 plus years ago, and also given the increased media bias that I have noticed toward herbal medicines in recent years. Hmm. The majority of respondents, though, indicated support for the use of Indigenous healing practices in health maintenance and preventive care and in symptom management. What they didn't indicate support for were the use of Indigenous healing practices as adjuncts to disease management. Respondents indicated a desire for patient-centered care and talked about agency in care and team-based care with elders and healers. However, the authors of the article also state that there was, and I'll quote here, frequent conflation of indigenous healing practices with forms of complementary medicine or religions, end quote. This was demonstrated with responses such as, quote, religious beliefs need to be kept separate from medicine. The authors also identified evidence bias as a major theme, as respondents indicated a desire for biomedical type evidence on Indigenous healing practices, such as peer-reviewed, published, and randomized controlled trial data. In the words of the article authors, and I'll quote again, this desire demonstrates a lack of understanding of Indigenous knowledge and approaches to evidence, including accumulation of empirical observations 
passed down through oral tradition. And one respondent actually wrote that, quote, this is currently an evidence-free zone. Well, I guess they haven't talked to any Indigenous healers or attended any ceremonies or considered the difference between Indigenous health prior to colonization and Indigenous health after colonization, because the evidence, including peer-reviewed papers, is there. The evidence bias also indicates what the authors call a hierarchy of medicines, in which Western biomedicine is assumed to be the best treatment and other healing practices are tolerated as long as they don't interfere with the effectiveness of or adherence to biomedical treatment plans. As one respondent said, the acceptance of alternative therapeutic practices distracts individuals from appropriate therapy. The authors of the article characterize these sorts of responses, responses as indicative of what they call a savior ethos around the place and purpose of Western medicine. As one respondent wrote, there comes a time when it becomes heartbreaking to see how the indigenous patient does not want Western Rx medicine, even when it is the standard of care worldwide. So I think this is a good place to point out that the World Health Organization has stats that indicate that traditional medicine accounts for around half of all healthcare delivered in China. In Chile, 71% of the population uses traditional medicine. In Colombia, 40% of the population. In India, 65% of the population in rural areas use Ayurveda and medicinal plants to meet their primary healthcare needs. And in so-called developed countries, I can't get into the problem with that label because that's a different talk. Traditional medicine and alternatives to chemical drugs are becoming more and more popular. In Australia, France, and the US, half the population has used traditional medicines and natural health products at least once. And 70, 70% of the population in Canada has used traditional medicines and natural health products also at least once. So although that particular respondent may believe that Western biomedicine is the standard of care worldwide, actually the WHO stats tell us something very different about what's going on on the ground and in communities. This savior ethos is, as the paper's authors point out, central to colonization. Apparently, Indigenous peoples have religions and we have beliefs and we do harmless little dances and other activities that might convince us that we feel better. But apparently we don't have science or medicine and we need Western medicine to come and save us from our ignorance. Given the state of relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada today, where the federal government declares that it wants a better relationship with Indigenous peoples, then sends federal police and tactical gear to take down a checkpoint on wet sweat and territory that has never been ceded under international law, or that citizens refuse to acknowledge the inherent rights or treaty rights of Indigenous peoples, purposefully attacking Mi'kmaq fishers destroying their equipment and excluding them from local services, then it should be no surprise that there's a bit of a disconnection and that despite their, respondent, their responses, survey respondents also stated that they supported reconciliation in medicine. So think about that for a minute. There can be no reconciliation no restoration of friendly relations, no mutual understanding, if the task is undertaken from within colonial constructs of medicine, from within evidence bias and a hierarchy of medicines. If we are to achieve reconciliation in medicine, medical practitioners cannot control the frame of understanding, the methods of dialogue, and the definitions of what medicine is or isn't. Racism is about power and colonialism is about control. 
these responses and those beliefs indicate that we have a long way to go toward creating equity in Canadian healthcare. Now, before colonization, Indigenous medicine people had knowledge that also gave them political power. Medicine people were respected for their ability to see things and for their knowledge about the workings of the world. Early settlers, and this is documented from primary documents, recognized their abilities and often sought care from Indigenous medicine people. Government agents, however, and missionaries soon realized that these medicine people would be a huge barrier to assimilation. So they took deliberate action to weaken the position of medicine people within Indigenous societies. Medicine people were ostracized and criminalized and Indigenous science and medicine went underground. The goal was assimilation and cultural genocide through an attempt to discredit and replace Indigenous science and medicine with the Western biomedical model. Thankfully, Indigenous peoples have managed to save and are actively reclaiming Indigenous healthcare practices. Healing practices, including the use of plants as medicine, food as medicine, land-based ritual, healing circles, doctoring, sweat lodge ceremonies, and other holistic culture-based approaches have been used successfully by many Indigenous people. I know people personally who have never used antiretroviral treatments, but who have lived with full-blown AIDS for nearly 30 years, thanks to herbal recipes provided by Indigenous medicine people. I know people who were given bad prognoses who have become cancer-free with the help of Indigenous medicine people. I used herbal medicine and other modalities to heal from a hormone imbalance and system-wide inflammation caused by years of chronic trauma-related stress. Indigenous medicine works, and it's based on thousands of years of observation and empirical evidence. Indigenous peoples have been forced for too long to become bicultural under settler colonialism, constantly code switching or trying to in order to be seen and heard within the dominant society. So I pretty much figure that now it's time for someone else to do the work of learning how to be in another person's world. To create cultural safety, medical practitioners will have to become bicultural. They'll also have to dispense with the expert labor label and the savior ethos and let indigenous people teach them what they need to know. We've been talking a lot lately about reconciliation in Canada, but I'd like us to go farther so that we start talking about the indigenization of our systems and institutions. So for healthcare, that would mean adopting Indigenous practices, ideas, values, and knowledges throughout institutions and throughout all aspects and all parts of the timeline of patient care, beyond tokenistic gestures of recognition or inclusion and toward actual meaningful structural change. Then I'd like us, because I'm never happy, <laughs> Actually, I'm very joyful, but I'm never happy when it comes to creating change. Then I'd like us to start talking about how we decolonize the structures and systems of Canadian society. So from indigenization to decolonization, how we remove and undo colonial elements. So in medicine, that would be seeing the body as separate from everything else in creation. The myth of objectivity, don't get me started on that one, we do not have time. And the bizarre fear of herbal medicine, which is especially bizarre when we consider that a great many pharmacological drugs are derived from plant sources. <laughs> we need to think about how we return power and control over patient care to indigenous patients and families without experts playing gatekeeper. 
and where indigenous ways of knowing and doing are perceived, presented, and practiced as equal to Euro-Western ways of knowing and doing within the medical system. When someone comes to you with their pain, with their body and behaviors, showing signs of imbalance due to their life experiences and or their relationship to the natural world at this moment, they're not asking you to decide if their experience or their knowledge is valid. They're asking you to help them become whole. That starts with hearing their stories and addressing the disconnection that colonialism creates by encouraging them to engage or re-engage with the world as a whole being. This means helping the patient to be more aware of their bodies and helping them recognize the distortions in thought and feeling that they may have developed as a result of experiencing trauma. Thinking of their bodies as the enemy, for instance. Creating cultural safety also means understanding the science behind Indigenous approaches. For example, how drumming and dancing creates entrainment and other positive neurobiological effects. And expanding your knowledge of Indigenous healing practice, even when it conflicts with what is taught in medical school. I tell you, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard a Western biomedical practitioner state with absolute confidence that detoxification isn't a thing because that's what the liver and kidneys do, oh, I'd be a very rich woman. Indigenous science and medicine functions from within the context of the quantum universe, the stars that were referenced in many ways in the opening invocation. We use the principles of quantum physics and the particles and waves that make up energy and matter to understand the body in relation to the world. When people have unresolved emotions from experiences of trauma, that energy can absolutely get stuck in the physical body. I've experienced it myself, both the stucking and the unstucking. When that happens, the energy needs to be unstuck in order to return the patient to the balance that is the foundation of well being. Now, I recognize that Western biomedicine is unsuited to this sort of thing, and that's fine. But Western biomedical practitioners must begin to recognize that non Western, non European, non enlightenment based frameworks and approaches work in their own way and are valid. So for Indigenous medicine people, detoxification is definitely a thing. Creating cultural safety in healthcare is also about knowing the realities of colonization and the everyday impacts created by the trauma of colonization, as well as the continuing policies and practices of colonialism. Many Indigenous patients have conditions that are very stubbornly resistant to treatment and therefore unmanageable. This is because they are not receiving care that, address, that addresses the trauma, the post-traumatic stress disorder and complex post-traumatic stress disorder that underlie and perpetuate those conditions. Many times, and I have experienced this myself, the care that is provided is re-traumatizing and actually exacerbates the condition or complaint. When a person who has experienced prolonged, repeated trauma enters a system that does not understand the effects of trauma on the colonized body, or that blames them for their pain as a result of the patient either doing or not doing something, the result is devastating on multiple levels. However, when patients are assisted in building connections between traumatic experiences and health, then the effects can be transformative and they can lead to real healing. When patients are, are assisted in understanding that 
dis-ease, unhealthy coping mechanisms, and the self-medicating behaviors that result are connected to childhood and adult trauma, they begin to feel more self-acceptance and they make progress toward health and well-being. Medical practitioners who understand this connection are able to create clinical environments that are less triggering for both patients and staff. When everyone is calm and able to think clearly, and by that, I mean think with heads as well as hearts. And when the relationship is based on trust, then practitioners are able to develop treatment alliances and treatment plans with their patients instead of for their patients. That's the true meaning of agency and patient-centered care. Now, I'm sure all or most of you have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which shows that childhood trauma and poor attachment to parents and caregivers has been shown to be a major risk factor for the most common causes of adult illness, death, and disability in the United States, uh, where the original study was done, but these, you know, the data sets have been correlated with, with other studies uh, that were done in other ways throughout the Americas. Childhood physical and sexual abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction are linked to adult heart, lung, and liver disease, to obesity, diabetes, and depression, to substance use disorders, a higher risk of sexually transmitted infection, and intimate partner violence at rates higher than those who have not experienced trauma. Numerous studies have also shown the link between poor health and trauma experienced in adulthood. For Indigenous peoples, experiences of trauma need to be situated within the context of the historic events of colonization and the intergenerational trauma that colonization has created. The unresolved emotions that are associated with the trauma that Indigenous peoples have experienced, witnessed, or inherited through epigenetics and family systems creates a cycle of health outcomes and behaviors that are passed down from generation to generation. Differing communities, differing families experience different impacts to different degrees. But the impacts are felt on a day-to-day -day basis by survivors and their families. To be trauma-informed, a practitioner must be, aware, must be aware of the myriad ways in which trauma is manifested in and on the body. Even when survivors only have intrusive images, flashbacks and triggers as memory, their body tells the story. Survivors of childhood sexual abuse, for example, have higher incidences of stomach aches, headaches, and back pain. Sometimes survivors are so disconnected from their bodies as a result of dissociation and self-blame that they can't even begin to describe what they feel other than to say that they feel pain. Now, in my experience, chronic pain is not generally understood by Western biomedical practitioners because it is a diagnostic enigma. There are no lab results that confirm the existence of the pain and any treatments that are attempted fail to address the pain, usually because the treatment are aimed at the symptoms of the pain and not the underlying cause of the patient's dis-ease. As a result, and unfortunately, many me medical practitioners become frustrated with Indigenous patients who report chronic pain. They are often thought of as complainers and they're often told that the pain is in their head. At its worst, they are thought of as seeking care to access prescription drugs. Western biomedicine cannot interpret what patients with chronic pain are saying and showing because chronic pain doesn't easily fit the disease models taught in medical school. There's no tissue damage, little to no evidence to support the patient's complaint. So what Western medicine biomedicine needs to understand is that dis-ease is the manifestation of imbalance within the whole. 
the symptoms themselves are not the problem. They just point to the disconnection and distorted relationships that underlie the symptoms. That story, I'm sorry to say, but it's true, is not seen through the lens of a microscope or in the images of an x-ray or a scan that isolates parts from the whole. That story is the sum total of everything that the patient has seen, experienced, heard, and understood across time. Being trauma-informed is about knowing the histories, experiences, and perspectives of Indigenous people, both pre- and post-colonization, and seeing the connection between colonial power and control and poor health outcomes. But being trauma-informed is only the foundation for trauma-informed care. To promote healing, practitioners must create a calm, safe, and empowering environment for patients and for staff. They must inquire about current and lifelong abuse that, they, that the patient has experienced, about PTSD and CPTSD, about depression and substance use using an empathetic non-judgmental approach. They must provide, and this is a must, not a should for me, on-site and community-based programs that promote safety, reconnection to self and society, and healing, whatever that means for the patient, because it can mean different things. For Indigenous patients, this includes opportunities for group healing, for community-based events that promote healing, because in Indigenous worldviews, health is grounded in social relations. Remember, Wakotun. To be trauma and healing informed, practitioners must make changes in their behavior and in their practice. For example, trauma survivors often report that when they feel a lack of control in medical settings, it increases their anxiety. Now, this scenario can include, but is certainly not limited to, having their bodies exposed, a fear of powerlessness or being alone with an unknown provider, fear of having something inserted into their body, fear of not being able to breathe or swallow, fear of being touched, and fear of being unconscious. Asking Indigenous patients about their priorities for the visit, offering them an overview of what will happen during the interaction, presenting a brief summary of what parts of the body will be involved, allowing the patient to ask questions, all of these approaches offer patients choice and a sense of control. Patients who are anxious in the supine position due to a history of sexual abuse may feel more comfortable if offered a pillow for their back so that they can be more upright and see procedures or examinations that would be out of their field of vision if they were lying down. Another way to mitigate anxiety is to ask every patient, not just the Indigenous ones, what you can do to make them more comfortable during the appointment. Patients might want to leave the door slightly ajar. They may want to sit closer to the door and have more distance between you and them. Don't take it personally. Or they may request that a support person be present during a physical examination. One thing to remember, reassurance is not the same as collaboration. Telling a patient with a history of trauma that they have nothing to worry about, you'll be fine, will not help them feel more in control. Encouraging them to collaborate in their appointment or in their care will help them experience more control, which can lead to feelings of trust. So, becoming trauma and healing informed and healing informed also requires medical practitioners, and this is a big one, to remember that providing care isn't just a one-way transaction where the story is just about the patient. Everything in the Indigenous universe is reciprocal, and providing care is a reciprocal act. 
So you must consider your own positionality and your own experience when considering colonial trauma, including your own experiences of colonization and conversion and the times when you were a perpetrator of colonialism and conversion. By understanding your own history, you will better understand your own reactions, both to situations like this talk and to serving patients with a history of trauma. How you think is likely, is likely not how your ancestors thought. Does that make them uncivilized? Ignorant, mere creatures of myth and superstitious ceremony? Mm. If you've bought into the fiction that the past is uncivilized and the contemporary world is somehow smarter or more objective or more scientific, then you, my friend, have been colonized. So I would ask you to ask yourself the following. How have your beliefs been created and your adherence monitored by oppressive forces interested in pursuing imperialism, dogma, patriarchy, individualism, competition, extraction, and linear thinking. Colonialism, as I've said, is about disconnection and control. If you're disconnected from your own indigeneity, wherever that may be, disconnected from your own experiences and cultural perspectives in favor of a Western biomedical model, disconnected from the times when you continued the cycle by being a part of the problem, even when well-intentioned, then no matter where you come from, you have been coerced into accepting a Euro-Western Enlightenment-centric worldview whose ideas about society, education, healthcare, science, economics, the natural world, and everything else, focus on disconnection and control. You will have to actively seek to change that position if you are interested in adequately addressing the health effects of trauma as they are seen in Indigenous peoples and communities in Canada. I think for homework, reconciliation in medicine, in medicine should start with reading articles 23 and 24 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Calls to Action. And I won't quote them here because I presume you have already read them or I expect you to go and look them up after we're done here tonight. It's also about reading and aligning your professional practice with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's online. But at its heart, reconciliation is about how non-Indigenous service providers think. And whether you can see Indigenous science and medicine for what it is, meaning safe and effective, and not what you have been told it is. Canada tells itself many stories. One story it used to tell was the glorious settler narrative about how there was empty land that the settlers tamed to create what we now know as Canada. If you are a more recent immigrant, your version of the glorious settler narrative might center on ideas about creating a better life without considering the ways that this dream mirrors the colonial pursuit. Indigenous peoples and their allies have challenged that narrative. And today we have a richer understanding of Canada's history, or we're getting there. A history that tells more complex stories about cause and consequence that contain a little bit more nuance. That example shows that we've done it once, so I'm hopeful that we can do it again. I'm hopeful that Canada can begin to tell itself different stories about science and medicine and healing. Creating a healthcare system that recognizes, understands and honors indigenous science and medicine, as well as, because it's all or nothing with me, all non-Western science and medicine is the only way we're going to be able to overcome 
the immense physical, psychological, and spiritual challenges that Indigenous peoples are facing as a result of colonization. Now, I don't want to be too, but I say it's the only way because Western biomedicine sometimes seems very invested in keeping us sick which makes sense when, as I've said, you realize that this system is framed from within colonial constructs. Those constructs prioritize profit. By that, I mean the symptomology that too often passes as care for indigenous patients, the tests, the machines, the machines that keep us alive but don't make us healthy. Those things all make a lot of money for the entities that create them. So we need to start telling new stories about science and medicine and healing. And there's another reason too, because it's the only way Canada will ever overcome its colonial past and truly become a post-colonial country. These new stories about science and medicine and healing must emerge from a partnership between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, from a relationship that honors Indigenous ways of knowing and being. This partnership must emerge from an understanding that the dominant society does not own capital S science. It must emerge from patient-centered communication and care Indigenous science and medicine has the potential to successfully address the everyday impacts of intergenerational trauma that was, until recently, creating Canada's number one public health crisis. Indigenous science and medicine also has the potential to return Indigenous peoples and communities to a place where they are self-determining. And self-determination is a major component in healing from the trauma of colonization. So Canada has a choice. Either interrogate the stories you think you know and decide to travel the road of healing and learning with us or continue as you are and create further trauma through oppression and control. We must begin to tell the true stories about what helps and what hurts all of us together. The choice is always yours. And with that, I will say thank you for listening. And hi, hi. Thank you. Hi, hi, Suzanne. <laughs> thank you very much. Wow. Making some room for all of us. We're gathered virtually to let, let some of that sink in in this moment. Yeah. Fighting, fighting those with questions to feel free to type them into the Q&A if, if feeling called. Oh, more generally for all of us noticing the support beneath us, whether under our feet or whatever we're sitting on. <laughs> noticing the quality of breath. I was exactly gonna work, I was gonna work a grounding exercise into <laughs> I don't know I probably would have time. I don't want to speak too long. <laughs> oh, <laughs> little guy <well, we've> <laughs> There's plenty of time. Yeah. Is there do we have time? Is there a secret message here? Plus plus nine? What is that? <laughs> is that like I'm a wondering. Like I was wondering. Yeah, I was really wondering. It came right around the time where you hinted at the pandemic, I think. Oh, <laughs> so so okay. I wonder if there's a connection. But if yeah. Christine wants to clarify, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I don't know. If, if Christine is a young person, I do not know the world. Of <laughs> text, <laughs> right. Yes. Oh, pet on keyboard. That's even better. <laughs> Turns out it was her pet. Thanks, Christine. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I see that Hannah Lee has raised her hand. So Hannah, do you want to speak? Can you speak? Wondering. Oh, Hannah says that was an error. 
Okay. Or pets so on keyboards. People experiencing the raised hand option. <laughs> Very okay. Not a worry. Uh, and there's also see. the Q and A box too, but yes, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any open questions. Not at the moment. Susanda has raised their hand. I'm not sure if. Uh, Susanda, you'd like to pose a question? Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. So allowed to talk. This is <laughs> yeah, that seems very regulated. Okay, allowed to talk. Susanda, you're you're live and Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, beautifully. Oh hi there, Suzanne. It's Susanda calling from Toronto. <laughs> I wanted to raise my hand and thank you so much for this talk. I learned so much. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I was worried that it was going to be a little too much reality, but I figure, you know, that's my job. Uh, I don't think I want to waste anybody's time with, you know, saying surface type things, right? I, I don't see any point in that. We have to keep it real, right? So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for Thank you for being so real. A question I have is um, what sort of like responses have you gotten that um, surprise you after um, writing your novel or uh, after people have re uh, read your novel or your book? Oh, hmm, I'm glad we have some time because, it, you know, I want to start uh, that answer by saying I was I was scared <laughs> when I wrote Legacy. I was I was like <laughs> right. Um, I I had to do a lot of skyping with the elder whose medicine wheel model I include in the book. You know because I said who am I to be putting this down in a book? Like what the right? And so that had to be talked through. And and I was just told that no, once you have knowledge, it's your duty to share it for the benefit of community. And I thought, okay, good, <laughs> but I had to kind of work through that. And um, I was also a little bit, you know, wondering, I tried throughout the book to be really nuanced as I tried even in this talk to speak about intergenerational trauma and the shortcomings in terms of our structures and systems here in Canada. Uh, but in a way that also recognizes the good things that are going on and the changes that have occurred, you know, so like mentioning, and I, I made so many attempts in the book to do this where I would say, you know, these are some challenges and this is what's going on and we need to be aware of this. Uh, but we also have stories of joy and achievement, right? So don't think I'm only saying this. I'm, I would never pathologize my own people. However, we need to have open, honest conversations about what we see. Right. So so there was all of that going on. And so I'm happy to report that the response has been amazing. I am so thankful for my readers. I have the best readers, honestly. They are are so loving and lovely. And they send me wonderful messages of, of thanks and support. And they send me challenging questions around you know, their family history, or, you know, how could I find more information on this? Or where did you get that? Or, you know, um, and, and I would end by saying that, you know, it's, it's been really, um, what's the best word to use? I guess it's been really eye opening for me, if that's the best word to see just how many people needed and wanted this talk this information, because there was times when I was writing and, you know, I'd be translating research papers and trying to put it, you know, in a, in a way that would make sense to a general audience, uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, of course. And I would say, oh, they have to know this, right? Surely people know this or no, 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 this has been said or yeah. And I would begin to get into this self-doubt, right? And, and the response has been so overwhelmingly just like stuff around, I never knew this. Thank you for saying this. This makes sense now. I understand my mother now. I understand why, you know, my kid does what he does or whatever it is. I am just so thankful for my readers um, for 
for connecting with the book and sharing with me that they've connected in very personal ways. Um, and the healthcare providers uh, as well for, for you know, having the, the openness and the strength to say, you know, you've made me think about things differently and I have to go away and, and put this down and think about it. Um, mm -hmm. It's been really amazing. So that was a long answer, but uh, you know, it was what it was. <laughs> amazing, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah. So we've got a few more questions that have come in, which is so exciting. So I'd love to read a few. So the first is from Tanya Webb who asks, how do you envision providing a culturally safe space in a hospital setting? Hmm. <laughs> well, An easy one, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Start me out with the easy one. Uh, well, here's, I mean, I wrote about this a little bit in Legacy where I entered the mythical world of a hospital where a patient goes for care and, you know, the attending physician uh, is a biomedical person, but that that person works in a dedicated team that is always present. And of course, different people at different times making up the team. But, you know, it, where there's a team approach where elders and non-Western healers from different uh, modalities, whether it's traditional Chinese medicine, whether it's Ayurveda, whether it's indigenous medicine people, shamans, whoever, work together. I mean, I, it sort of seems like the realm of myth right now because you think, how would that work with all the underfunding and, you know, the changes we need to make in facilities, the crowding. But I, I think unless we dream it, it's never going to happen. We have to envision this world and work to make it happen. Right. So that's one thing in a hospital setting is that team and not having the team just be the Western biomedical guys right, <laughs> or girls. Um, and but having it mixed between modalities. Um, and and I think, you know, uh, is it the TRC. Yes. Uh, Articles 23 and 24 get into the training of medical practitioners. And so uh, and and also the creation of having like a healing intervener or a, you know, like a guide, uh, someone that can be there for indigenous patients to sort of work through or to talk with during treatment. I think these sorts of things are starting to be set up in, in more hospital settings, but I think definitely they're minority. They're the minority and they need to be in every hospital, right? So I say, dream it and make it happen. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's a starting place for all of us, right? I'm thinking if any, everybody on the call yeah. sets an intention to do some of that dreaming work, that will move more quickly. Yeah. Right? Sort of the expectation there. Yeah. I'll follow up with Lisa Howard's question. So she, she said, thank you, Suzanne, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. And she asks, what are appropriate ways from settlers to recognize and honor indigenous knowledges while also actively respecting and protecting these knowledges from misappropriation and exploitation? Mm, great question, Lisa, thank you. Um, well, I think from my limited point of view, just doing the work that I do in the world, what I see is that, you know, there's a way to be, as I said in the address, uh, bicultural, where you sort of understand other worldviews and you can, you know, be in that place and then in your own place um, without actually trying to do those things, right? So I think there is a difference between when, you know, we share our ways, let's say we have a feast and some ceremonies and we share that together and people from, from all you know, backgrounds are invited, even if they're not indigenous. And then there's a difference between that and someone you know, uh, learning something from a book uh, uh, and without permission of a community or a specific leader of that ceremony or whatever, going forward and like using that in their practice without really understanding it, right? So yeah. I think we just need to be careful on, on how we do things and that we make it just explicitly clear what I've just said. Like, no, you, you're here as a guest and we encourage you to understand and to learn 
uh, and to work in team teamwork with us. But that doesn't mean you get to like set up a sweat lodge this weekend and charge 400 bucks for every attendee. Like that's, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we just mm -hmm. need to be clear about that. I think. Um, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And it, it's making me think about the question about sort of inpatient perspectives and the idea of, I'm going to be asking before telling <laughs> in a way that asking someone what, what approach might feel more right for them or what's missing and what we can try to make space for before sort of offering a $400 sweat lodge down the hall or something. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a difference there to sort of call in what's already there yeah. or somewhere around without sort of feeling like it's our job to sort of add it in. Yeah, in yeah, way, yeah. add it in. And you know, I'm I'm glad that you just brought that up because it twigs something in me, and it also goes with um, somebody's question on the Q and A there, uh, mm -hmm. which is this idea that you know not all Indigenous peoples pursue pre-colonial yes. healing modalities, <laughs> right? We're that. different. Yes. We yeah. have different beliefs, different comfort levels. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, there's still a lot. I dealt with it all my life. I was like 42 before I got my stuff together, right? I mean, there's a lot of internalized racism. There's a lot of just people saying, not that in my bag. And it has nothing to do with internalized stuff. It's just how they live their lives, right? So yep. yeah, I wouldn't necessarily presume to add it in, but to inquire as to the <laughs> clients or patients preferences yes and to make sure you can have it available right and i don't know is that a good time to sort of talk about that integration about the integrative uh, approach yeah i think so um, i think that sounds great because i think that showed up in a few questions oh my goodness there's so many questions this is so delightful awesome. um, but yeah is there something you were thinking of sharing on that note about into integrating or well, I mean, not being a practitioner myself, um, being a lay person who sort of, you know, moonlights in this world a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, there's someone here uh, who's staying anonymous who said, you know, I feel that the current medical model does not allow for time, education, acceptance of natural medicine, et cetera, for an integrative approach. Yes. So do you have any specific success stories? Um, oh. oh, beautiful. Well, I mean, I think, I think of the work that we were doing both at Anishinaabe Health and at Parkdale Queen West. And of course I was on the board before they merged with Parkdale, but mm. back in those days they were called Queen West Central Toronto Community. Anyway, whatever it was at the time. Um, and you know, where they would have both. At, and as I said in my talk, where, where both were, were weighted equally but that, as you said, means that the administration and the leadership, uh, however you term it, needs to, needs to put the focus on that. Need, like we have to ask for that time mm -hmm. and we have to keep asking. And we have to mm -hmm. keep asking that it be foregrounded and that it be um, included in what you know, we're doing as an institution. Um, I don't know if that's too general, but we just, we need to ask and keep asking. Um, and I have seen it done in, but I think the community health center model may lend itself more to that mm, mm, because there's events and because of the, so I don't know necessarily how you would do it like in a private practice. Um, but what I would say after years of working in the nonprofit sector is, you know, yes, we might work in a specific space, but we're always creating those, you know, cross institutional, if that's a word, uh, yep. connections, right? Mm -hmm. So you've yep. got to reach out and you've got to see yourself. And, you know, maybe this is an indigenous way of thinking, I don't know. But instead of just being this individual with this business who's offering this kind of care in my office, and then it's between these hours or whatever, you have to see yourself as part of a network of care and create those connections with mm -hmm. with other people or or indigenous organizations mm -hmm. who can help you be um more you know holistic yeah. or yeah. integrative yeah for sure so. thank you for that okay. it has me thinking on that note that the idea of being curious about whether we feel like we don't have enough time because mm -hmm. i think the question that came up for me while i was listening to you was the sort of this background voice of like, well, when, when do you find the time? 
to hear the whole story. Like you've only, you, you have people in the waiting room. Nine so, minutes, yeah, or the, whatever the, it the is. The virtual waiting room these days. But <sighs> this, yeah. this it, it strikes me that there's, there's value perhaps, again, one opinion among a multitude, the, the sense of being curious about how much scarcity is yeah. kind of driving the bus in a way that I, I think it imprinted on me years ago now that um, people often talk about how time feeling um, different with a wonderful physician. And it was interesting that I heard it many times from different people about how like they were in and out and yet it felt like they had all the time in the world with their beloved whomever, often family physician. And and that struck me that that seems like a, the special uh, form of recipe or alchemy, right? Of finding a way to help people feel at ease, like they're not being rushed, though also being mindful of, of people in the waiting room. And, yeah. and I think a lot of that is not being not being rushed ourselves or feeling like there's no time. That with with this idea of being curious about a story, not mm-hmm. feeling like we're gonna run behind or like. Mm-hmm run out of time with it, I think mm-hmm. is a starting place sometimes that mm-hmm. time is time is more flexible than I think we sometimes realize. Mm-hmm. And, and you our, know, you're yeah. making me think because when I was teaching in, in public schools in the mid aughts uh, and after into the tens, you know, there were times when I would have like two minutes before I had to go and get a classroom at a bell or whatever, <laughs> it would come up to me and want to tell me this big thing and it was major because it was something that they'd been dealing with and you don't want to squirsh that right (laughs) but I would just be totally transparent and say honey I want to listen to you this is amazing that you've come to me I really need to hear this because it's going to help me understand what you've been going through but you have two minutes (laughs) right and a lot of times they'd be like okay and then they would just, <laughs> right? Oh. And, and then I would say, okay, okay, you're not done. Follow me for the next minute. Keep talking. And then when I get to the door, then you really got to be done. And, oh. and they would totally be into it because it's just about being real. But yeah. they knew that I was listening. Yeah. Absolutely. They knew I was listening. Oh. But I think if we're just transparent about, okay, look, you got like four minutes. Right? Yeah beautiful boundaries yeah in uh, yeah and still invite the story and maybe have the story unfold across multiple appointments too Mm -hmm. yep that's beautiful (laughs) i think anyway and at least that idea of like i care about your story like i if i had the whole day i would love to sit down and hear more like i think that that acknowledgement goes a long way I'm very partial to the the signs and walking clinic. I, I don't want to. I don't want to stereotype walking clinics. So the that sort of story that goes around about the like one issue only oh, yeah. type of practice, where it's like you can tell me one problem and that's yeah. it. And and I think there's way more there in terms of the structure of funding and billing and all that. But I, it just makes me think about the 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 pain of making people come back when getting to a practitioner is a huge journey in its own right, right? Of like booking special transit and like taking a half day off work for the daughter who's bringing mom who can't get there on her own. That like saying, not today, come back is actually a loaded request that that can be a big deal. Not that you're saying to do that, but just that bigger picture of imagining what the journey looks like for people to come see us. I think it's often, it's rarely an easy kind of, like I'll just pop by the doctor and chat about my yeah. issues. Like yeah. it, it's there's more to it for most, yeah. let alone people with a history of trauma and maybe yeah. discomfort with coming at all. Yep. Sometimes the coming in and the getting up in the morning is like that makes you the most awesome person today. It doesn't matter that you know nothing else in the plan has been you know attempted. It's like no, you got up today and you got yourself here. Awesome, gold star. <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm so mindful of all of the beautiful posts that I want to get to. Yeah. But at the same time, I just want to make a quick plug that in my psychotherapy practice, I've discovered that there are people who are afraid to call to make an appointment. But I think I I just want to name that, that the, the world is changing and text is a different thing. But there are people who who can't even 
like they, they may not have the bandwidth to even call in to make an appointment, let alone come in that like there's often so much behind the scenes that I, I think for those of us who feel comfortable picking up a phone and calling to schedule an appointment, it, that's, that's actually a big deal, relatively speaking for some people who are maybe so frightened by that process. So just the idea of like, it's not easy to see us, whoever you are on the call for people to see you, for some people, it's a huge, it's huge, a huge thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm right. going to quickly glance here. I'm mindful we've got half an hour, which is am- amazing. That's good. Um, and I'm yeah. letting you figure out the two different boxes, Chase, and like, <laughs> when it's, that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. I appreciate the support from people. And I apologize if somehow we miss you. I'm going to read Alana's post um, and we'll go from there. So firstly, Alana says, thank you for this lecture. You've expanded my understanding of what reconciliation is and needs to be with relation to healthcare. To move more deeply into reconciliation and indigenous medicine capitalized, which is beautiful. Thank you. What might be some appropriate and respectful ways to seek out this knowledge? Oh, wow. Another great question. Oh, that impresses me. Uh, it takes a lot to impress me, but you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Go, um, Anna. <laughs> yay. Um, hmm. I think, well, I'm going to talk about the thing to be mindful of first and then maybe give slightly more concrete examples of, you know, things you can do. The thing to be mindful first is be mindful if you're, you're you know, trying to connect, because I know this happens, with uh, you know an indigenous focused program at a community health center or with an indigenous health center or with any sort of like um, you know community run social service or health related organization that sort of thing be aware that the level of of need in the community is high and so the likelihood that like don't be offended if we don't call you back okay don't be offended because it doesn't mean that we wouldn't love to talk to you over tea someday or that we wouldn't love for you to volunteer here or whatever, but it's just that, you know, the level Mm. of underfunding, understaffing, the level of need at the community level, that, you know, that is always gonna be the thing that that is is number one on people's plates. Mm. So don't be offended if you reach out and don't get a call back. It's not that you've done something wrong necessarily, or hardly ever. It's just that the, there is a level of need and there is not enough support available. So that's one thing to be mindful of. Um, and I think, again, I'm big on, but I realize that this is a struggle for people who can be shy or again, you know, if you're in a rural environment, I mean, I, I know all of that, but I, I hope that there's ways that you can figure out how to do this, the this being try to make those connections with, I mean, there's post-secondary institutions across Canada that have events like this, that have, you know, student associations that put on speaking events, you know, these sorts of things. So definitely approach colleges and universities. Um, I think also, as I've said, I mentioned volunteering, become a volunteer at, you know, an Indigenous run organization. And, you know, start checking out the monthly calendar of events at the Friendship Center, at the Women's Center, or whatever it is. And, you know, start learning alongside, right? Um, So reach out and make those connections. Um, And I, I, I hear the way that you said, you know, what are appropriate and respectful ways, you know, I think the most appropriate and respectful thing to do is just to, to, how do I say this nicely? <laughs> you know, like, don't take up too much space, right? Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Because it isn't necessarily your space to take up space in, right? Mm. And so when you're, you know, connecting as a volunteer or even at a community event, just, you know, be yourself. 
I, you know, I'm not saying, you know, you have to like zip your lip or anything. Um, I mean, conversation is always good, but just, just be mindful of, okay. So here's something that I was told. I don't know if this is apocryphal or, or if it actually is based on, on an actual thing. Some old Kokum or Muslim said at one point, mm. I once heard that yes. someone said that the creator gave us two eyes, two ears and one mouth. <laughs> so do twice as much looking and listening as you do talking. So that's what oh. I would say. <laughs> if it's <laughs> apocryphal and it's on a Hallmark card somewhere, well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I think it might be in the Talmud. I oh, think. Maybe. Maybe. I think I've seen okay. it in both worlds. Yes, which means that it's important if it's yes. if it's on different continents. Yeah, two uh, ears and one mouth. Yeah. So, so the ratio is two to yeah. one. Yeah, four to one. Boop, boop. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Right. Yes. Right. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> I forgot about the eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. That kind of connects with Rob Smith's comment. Um, thank you so much. This was mind expanding. Wondering, what advice do you share with learners coming from settler backgrounds who want to build the relationships needed to? steps in decolonizing medicine and public health. And that connects as well with, uh, there was one other one here that was a similar kind of question. So can you please comment uh, more about re-examining our self-narrative and history as settlers? Yeah, um, I saw that one too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you, 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 you planted that seed already about not taking up the whole scene in a yeah. way now, and not being offended. And for some reason, the first part just flew out of my brain, Chase. I get the mm. nationality of yeah. the first part flew out yeah. of my head. <laughs> Advice? No, that's totally fine because I, I, they didn't go together as well as I'd hoped. Okay. Um, but they do go together. What advice do you share with learners coming from settler backgrounds who want to build relationships needed? to take steps in decolonizing medicine and public health. Yeah, No, I think so. they're totally related actually, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that it's any different. Uh, you know, the learning just has to happen. Um, you have to seek out connections with groups, people, go to events, just be a learner. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think, as I said in my talk, just not assuming that because you do have your own history of colonization, perhaps depending on your situation or country of origin um, or ancestral country of origin, um, it, that you're not also implicated in what's going on here <laughs> because uh, unceded territory is unceded territory. <laughs> and if you live on it, then you're implicated, right? Um, I don't know if everyone's aware of and I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately. It's on my desktop so, or in my folder somewhere. Um, I'm not sure the organization that put it out. Could it have been the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health? I don't know, but there is a paper out there. If you Google it, you probably will find it. And it's called, Are People of Color Settlers Too? And uh. it's, it's one chapter in a larger publication of like-minded uh, papers. So it's all about how do we create relationality in Canada from such a diverse, you know, set of, you know, citizens with their own very diverse histories, experiences, perspectives. So that might be helpful as well. Um, I definitely uh, read a couple of the pieces in that publication. And it is available for free online. So uh, Google if, uh, what was it again? Are people of color settlers too? Yeah. Thank you. So a few really interesting questions that I'm noticing that I think could be really powerful. Oh, wow. I think. Oh, someone's posted Pratchy it. Pratchy posted it. Thank you, awesome. Pratchy. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Yeah. Um, okay. Awesome. That's <laughs> so exciting. Thank you. Um, oh, amazing. So Amal poses, I think, a really practical, relevant question that also reflects the TRC calls to action, which people will look up or remember. Yeah. So um, Amal writes, thank you for this amazing talk. 
are there any promising initiatives whereby health professionals trained in Western med medical model effectively consult and refer patients? Hmm. Um, and then he, or they added referral to community-based healing practices I met. So hmm. wondering a little bit about that. And it kind of actually loops back to the first question of like what to do on an inpatient ward, for example, or if we're, we're playing allopathic doctor or health team member, how do we respond to that call to action to help someone be connected with an indigenous or a traditional healer? Yeah. Uh, are there any promising initiatives? Hmm. You know, I don't actually know if that's the mythic world that I want, that I've created in my mind. <laughs> or whether it is actually happening yet. If anybody knows that it is, please tell us where. Um, I, I don't know of any yet. What I've mostly heard about is, you know, the setting up of elders' rooms or the setting up of, you know, patient care. What did I call them before? Like an intervener, like a touch point person. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there's... There's people, Indigenous focused or Indigenous centered, I'm not sure the best way to even describe it, you know, folks being brought in to the systems. That's yeah. a start. I don't know, though, that, yeah, whether it's actually like a team, like a peer consult and then a referral. I have not personally heard of that yet, but I live in hope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Now, actually, one thing that occurs to me, actually, I should say, just to be clear, um, is that, you know, herbal medicine and medicine people, we have a lot of young people who are interested in learning this. And yet we have, you know, older people who are either passing mm -hmm. or they're so busy that they can't possibly teach the young folk. Um, and we also get you know, communities where, again, just like with the social service organizations um, or the community organizations where the need is so great that, you know, there's not enough medicine people actually go around from community to community. And by that, I mean rural, urban and on reserve, right? So to refer a patient somewhere, you need to have somewhere to refer them to. And I know even health centers like Anishinaabe Health and, you know, um, Where's the other one that I know of? Uh, there's an on-reserve one that just opened. I think it's in Saskatchewan, but I don't remember the First Nation. Um, you know, there's just so much going on, right? That I'm not sure that they're even set up to take referrals yet, but it exists as a mythical place and a, and a mythical process that I want to happen. I will will it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Makes me want, I think, again, in this moment, I'm very Toronto centric, um, though mindful about some of the initiatives here. So, like, Call Aunties has been one of the initiatives with the, the pandemic where mm -hmm. people can call Aunties and it's like a, a helpline basically to help people direct or get directed to services yeah. in connection with seven generation midwives. And so, yeah. There are some kind of growing initiatives like that. Yeah, to actually oh. refer people if people call. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I forgot about the aunties line. And you know what? That reminds me, what is that 1-800 line? Is it oh. healing hmm. care or something? Ooh. Remember healing hotline, something like that. Uh, I hope they didn't lose their funding. About a year, maybe two years ago, I saw big, uh, when I was still living in Toronto, I saw big signs about it on the, you know, uh, up in the subway on the, the advertising. I don't know if it's still around though. Um, but yeah, yeah, there were uh, Indigenous uh, people and speaking various languages as well that you could call in and connect. So amazing. Yeah. In this moment, I, uh, I can't help myself and I'll make a plug for the Center for Wise Practices and Indigenous yeah. Health at Women's College. <laughs> Um, and the idea of connecting with, with, with um, yeah, the group at Women's College, um, if there are questions, to sort of get pointed in the right direction, particularly in terms of 
uh, again, after that question of if someone identifies as indigenous and asking how we can support them in their healing process, the what's next? Because I think sometimes it's easy to get stuck at the fire, um, like fire bans yeah. on smudging or the, the uh, ways that sort of institutional settings might might run into some some trouble. Um, that it's easier said than done to smudge in a scent free, very sort of fire preventive setting. And so there are barriers. And so calling on people who have figured out the pathway, like the Center for Wise Practices, can be a source of support. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> um, okay. So a few more questions, maybe, because we're almost at quarter two. Let's see. Um, there are a few questions that I thought were interesting. So um, let's see. Um, one person, an anonymous writer, writer, I just wanted to ask, how do you propose a more integrative approach, i.e. combining indigenous medicine and Western medicine? Because I feel the current medical model does not allow for time, education, acceptance of natural medicine for this integrative approach. Um, there's that one. And then in connection, there's another one about sort of some of the more contemporary issues like obesity, type two diabetes, depression, alcoholism, and infectious disease like TB, um, and how indigenous health can help address those issues, which um, you're noting like are a bit more contemporary than, than not. Mm -hmm. I any thoughts coming for that. Well, is, it, is the question really around how we understand the disease model? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> from indigenous perspective, because okay. I, I was <laughs> my, I was considering raising this in in my talk, and then I just knew I wouldn't have time, so I ended up taking it all out. But there's some really interesting scholarship, um, so I'm I'm doing an analogy here uh, around uh, traditional Chinese medicine and what they've been doing to treat COVID nineteen, right? and the success, the success that they've had with various coronaviruses. So um, I wonder if that's the same sort of thing that we need to start looking at instead of trying to find space in Western medicine for indigenous medicine, just saying, this is how indigenous medicine deals with it. And again, in the mythic world <laughs> that isn't here yet, but I really want to be um, making sure that we have, you know, indigenous health centers that also have training programs that mm. also, you know, are, are able to, you know, take referrals that also are working, able to have employees working, you know, in a team in institutional settings. So yeah. rather than the making space, and, and, and looking at it from a disease model, how would indigenous medicine people understand tuberculosis and understand diabetes? Now, we don't have time for, for me to tell you some of the things I've heard from practitioners, but you know, we do have ways of looking at this. Um, you know, just one small example, like diabetes, for example, I've heard an indigenous medicine person that I connected with in 2019, um, you know, we had a bit of a talk around how she felt that, you know, it was really a metaphor for, this is not to diminish it by the way, but it was a metaphor, like the whole state of disease around sugar was a metaphor for not enjoying the sweetness of life. Mm. And that the chronic pain mm -hmm. that people experience and how that creates stress and what, stress does to the endocrine system and da, 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 you know all that stuff right yeah. yeah so i think there are ways that we think of those things but it's not necessarily through the same model so you know instead of making space why don't we just make sure that these things exist and that people can access both or that we work in teams alongside i don't think it's impossible i know i'm asking a lot though <laughs> Yeah, it's so beautiful. It reminds me of wisdom from an elder that I heard years back that the the sort of the quality of a moon time or a menstrual cycle reflects the previous month. Mm -hmm. um, 
And as a non-menstruator, I'm a person who doesn't have mood time, I have to watch myself because I don't have the right to talk about it. But it's a fascinating idea that that oh, our yeah. bodies, our bodies keep the score in every way. And that's a very sort of very sort of stark and bright colored or dark colored way that that kind of reveals what's been happening and invites Absolutely. invites reflection and and gentle recalibration for the next sort of cycle of the moon. And so it's just it's yeah. amazing that that that's so compatible with with yeah. other ways of understanding yeah. hormones and cycles. Yes, and absolutely. <laughs> so we might use different language to discuss, right. but essentially in most many, I don't know which one, we're actually talking about the same processes, yeah. but we might be using, you know, a different way of telling the story, but it is telling the same story, right? I mean, I, I remember, you know, being asked for the first time at, you know, going to a non-Western practitioner and yep. being asked, you know, the consistency of menstrual blood and snot and bowel movements and like, ha, ah, you know, you, you don't usually talk about this stuff in so-called polite society, but yep. um, it is it is absolutely a way of looking at things that might be different from, but no less valid than, right? So, and I know we've got yeah. lots of questions and also- I know. We've only got 10, 11 minutes now too. 11 minutes. So. <laughs> I'd, I'd invite people to look at the links that have been shared in the Q&A in the chat for further reference. If you like, if you click it, it will likely open another window for further exploration, like Wellness Wheel. Um, Sandra Ewan highlighted the Center for Wise Practices, which, which came up a moment ago. Um, the All Nations Healing Hospital in Southern Saskatchewan has been linked. So thank you so much for people who have posted that. There was a question in there that I wondered. Um, oh, there's a few here. There's there a few I know. Oh ah. my goodness, like a whole other two hours here. I, I have an author website. I'm also <laughs> on Facebook. Yeah, mm -hmm. Please do not take this as an ignore, but only as Western concepts of time. Right. So if we run out of time, feel free to contact me with your question. Just copy paste and send it to me another way. Absolutely, Beautiful. I will engage. <laughs> and please, if you haven't read Suzanne's book, please do. I, I think in my first point of contact with you, Suzanne, I mentioned how I wish that legacy was required reading for medical learners and all health science learners because it's whew, powerful reading and beautiful. And I'll just make a quick comment about what you write about the, um, the hierarchy of needs that, that apparently Maslow developed his hierarchy of needs based on the teepee. Yep. Um, which I won't explain. I'll simply invite people to read your book to yeah, sort of yeah. notice his connection with the Plains, yeah. Plains peoples. Yeah, uh, I heard Cindy Blackstock first share that. Um, oh, okay. Like, I heard it from a person who had attended a conference and blogged about it. And then, and I don't think that blog post is available, which is why I didn't cite it because it's, mm. it's not up anymore. But yeah. so this, this idea has been circulating in the community since Cindy first brought it up through her research, yeah. Amazing. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. so beautiful. So there are two comments at the bottom of the Q&A that I think maybe I'll read them out and you can sort of respond to okay. whatever lands in this moment. Okay. Um, and again, deep respect for everyone who posted and apologies that we didn't cover it all. Uh, yeah, I but, read it all though. <laughs> I did, I was probably all, through reading them it's all. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm just so delighted that people are here and and asking questions. So an anonymous person said that as a white settler who is an emerging leader in nursing, I'm wondering to what extent can I advocate for or lead initiatives to encourage appropriate cultural safety and trauma-informed care without taking up space that's not meant for me. I deeply wanna be a strong ally, but don't wanna stand in a space if I'm not the best or right person to be in that space. So that's sort of thought one. And thought two from Crystal is, I'm interested in knowing your thoughts about getting traditional healers recognized and covered under healthcare by the government, as well as herbal medicines covered under drug plans so that when an individual does not wish to use Western medicine, they're not having to incur extra expenses and having, have, a, a, I guess, a possible experience of equitable access to healthcare. I hope this makes sense. Crystal makes so much sense yes. <laughs> to me anyway. So uh -huh. I wonder if you, you'd love to respond to sort of a, a bit of those two other 
our final yeah. question before we come to an end. Yeah, before we end. Um, well, let's get to the last one first because I was like, yes, um, I actually had that in the book and then there was just too much. So a, a couple of things I had to take out. That was one of them because it was a bit of a rant. Um, yeah, the idea that, uh, I mean, I'm in favor of, and I know some companies, corporations do this with employee mm -hmm. healthcare plans where you are allowed to have like a certain amount of mm. money and you decide how to spend it. Right. Like health spending, I think yeah. that's what the federal program should be like. Um, I mean, let's face it. We don't really have universal Medicare in Canada because dentists aren't covered. Chiropractic isn't covered. I mean, most physiotherapists aren't covered or if at all, certainly TCM, acupuncture, massage therapy, all that stuff is not covered. Right. So yeah, I just say do it that way. And, and I don't know what the problem is, except they don't want to create electoral reform either. So maybe I'm just barking up the wrong tree there, but that's again, my mythical world. Um, oh, and I've done it again, Chai. What was the first one again? <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah. I'll read it again. <laughs> I'm just thinking of building on something you said before. Okay. I, I'm very curious about how many programs are funding um, knowledge translation. Because you mentioned how so many traditional healers and elders are either dying or they're, or they're overrun. So there's no time to teach another yeah. generation. And I wonder, like, wouldn't it be amazing if funding could go to training them so that there's yeah. actually like a yeah. support for that, that process of translation and, yeah. and. And Native Women's Resource Center in that position paper that I mentioned in Legacy, um, they put out a few years ago when they released that position paper that, you know, that was one of the, the planks of their mm. platform. Can you say planks in a platform? I just did. Uh, that was yeah. one of the items in their platform. Yeah, that, sure. You know, that they said that there must be a way created where this knowledge can be passed on and taught. Uh, like, um, mm. and then I suggest that, you know, training programs could be set up. Um, I wonder if there's not a way to do it virtually too, because I know that there are a couple of young people. I know there's one in Ontario who they've started websites and they are herbalists and they are mm -hmm. trying to share and they're trying to do the work. I don't know how they're doing the work or with who right now. I've, I've never actually talked to the two that I know about. I think only one is a website. So yeah, how can we do that work in supporting? I think, um, you know, maybe we could do it even virtually um, because, you know, I, I think one of the great things that traditional Chinese medicine has done is that it's, it's never been, a, and this is my understanding, but it's never been afraid to say, here's, you know, the recipes for this concoction, or, you know, in the classical texts, of course, have been in existence and written down for thousands of years. So that's a strength, but they've never been afraid to share that information. So I think Indigenous peoples, we need to start thinking about, like, for instance, what Jewish people have done with, like, the Holocaust Museum, or with, like, um, and why I raise that is because they have, like, um, survivor testimonies, oral yeah. tradition, you know, so we need to start thinking about ways to preserve this and maybe virtually is one of the ways. It's gonna mm -hmm. cost a lot of money though. <sighs> Where are we gonna get that? But <laughs> Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's an inspiration for us in yeah. Temerity Medicine, for sure, especially in terms of our, our training medical students and the idea of like, yeah. where, where is where can we welcome that kind of wisdom and learning yeah. for, for students. Yeah. So uh, the other piece as we close was about sort of feeling like a settler in a leadership role and wanting to uh, encourage appropriate cultural safety and trauma-informed care without taking up space. Space, right. So that might be a place to sort of close. <sighs> Would be a good place to end, yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, you're talking to someone who, <laughs> maybe I'm not the best person to even answer this because <laughs> I really thrive on conversations and on, you know, going to an event and connecting with someone or someone comes up to me after an event and asks the questions and then we yabber away for like mm -hmm. 20 minutes, right? Um, even when, you know, staff are turning off the lights and I'm like, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming, <laughs> right? We're talking here. Um, so for me, it's all about, um, 
making those connections. I think I've said this before, but maybe I just need to reiterate it. You know, making those connections, but when you make the connection, doing a lot of listening, right? Mm. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, just keep it in mind. I know it sounds simplistic, but it's actually really hard. It is. <laughs> it doesn't it is. happen. Um, mm. So just that, that to me is the way. We have to talk. We can't be in our solitudes, right? Oh, thank you. So I, I wonder as we close, I, I'll do sort of our formal little ending if that's okay. Um, and well, where are we at? We're at one minute to go. So, so first I, I have such deep gratitude, Suzanne, for you being willing to share with us tonight. I, I mentioned before we went live how like as starstruck I am because of how much I loved reading your book and how we both oh. talked about how like it, it showed up in my hands kind of mysteriously. Like I, I can't explain how that happened, but I'm grateful for it. And yeah, deeply honored that you got to share some of that with us tonight. And I encourage people to please read that book if, if any of this stood out, because there's, there's chapters more where this came from. Um, and I guess this wisdom of two ears, two eyes and one mouth, that, that, that maybe is a rule of practice in a way to be safe. Like I, I almost think as I'm saying that out loud, that that's a pretty helpful safety kind of equation, right? That yeah. if we focus on that, then we might be hopefully doing our best with room for yeah. adjustment. Yeah. Yeah. So that and, and, and really that room for, um, yeah, listening more <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and and not being afraid to connect to truly connect on an emotional empathetic level mm, you know mm -hmm. get rid of the blame get rid of the judgment not that i think anybody in this group has exhibited any of that but i just mean worldwide you know yeah. overall canada needs to get rid of that we just need to talk again again <sighs> <laughs> yeah beautiful yeah and and if people are open to it again take or leave but but this sense of being curious about how much time scarcity is getting in the way right our fear that we just don't have time for it or like i feel like that kind of frenetic pressure that there's no no space to to slow down is it feels real but i wonder how much of that is a myth or a story that we're telling sometimes so mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe yep. <laughs> yeah. on that note of time <laughs> um i suppose this is our end so okay. thank you so much suzanne thank you so much for everybody who came yes. and was able to stay until this time and of note it's recorded so it will be publicly posted some way somehow um i will look into that and 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 try to send it out to anybody who joined so people can watch again because there's much wisdom within the words you shared. So thank you so much. Miigwech, miigwech. Thank and you. Ask I, I, um, hi, hi. <laughs> Good night, all. Okay. Bye. Thank you for coming. See ya. <laughs>